All right. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Patriots First and Goal. I am Alex Shane breaking down the end of the preseason and cut down day with my good buddy, Rich Hill. Uh, Rich Hill, as somebody who has been cut many, many times over the course of his life from many, many, many teams, I have sympathy for these players getting so close to living their dream only to get their hopes dashed at the last minute. Got to be kind of a very tense, weird time around the NFL, these, these, these cut down days every season. Yeah, no, I mean, I feel like the weirdest position that you can be in as a player is the one where you're like, you make the initial roster, but you don't actually make it. Because right <laughs> now, like thinking of the, the Patriots right now, they have four players that they just claimed off of waivers from other teams. After their initial rosters have been set, they've claimed four players. That means four people who thought they made this initial roster aren't actually going to make it. And that's got to suck so <laughs> much because you feel like you're going to make it. Dan Skipper, former Patriots tackle from you know four years ago or something like that. Uh, he's in his eighth season with the league. He's now with the Lions. I think this is the first time in his eight-year career that he's made an active roster coming out of camp, which is both very impressive that he's had an eight-year career without making an initial roster, but also like imagine being in that mindset every single year. Yeah. You call your mom like, hey, mom, guess what? I made the NFL team. And like, as you're hanging up, he's like, oh, I just got cut. I have to recall my parents and say I'm moving back home. It's very, very tough. I mean, th this is this is such a, a cutthroat business. And we as fans, we try to be sympathetic and appreciate it. But there's a level that I'll just never, never understand. But I am psyched to talk about the roster. The Patriots roster is as set as it can be at this point in time with you. Get your thoughts on it. But first, let's start off first and goal. There was a game that happened before cutdown day. Sunday night, the Patriots took on the Commanders. They lost 20 to 10 in a game that was kind of weird because like everybody that was wearing a Patriots jersey seemed to have at least gotten one or two snaps in. They were just playing everybody the commanders not so much we didn't really see that that, that drake may Jaden daniels matchup we were hoping for but that's that's all right uh not Jaden daniels so Jaden daniels yeah Jaden daniels uh but that's okay initial thoughts on this preseason game and any kind of overall final thoughts on the patriots preseason the whole rich what do you got for me yeah i mean i the biggest thing that i took away from this one or maybe the two biggest things one is that the offensive line is as bad as we thought it was going to be. This offensive line is atrocious. It feels just as bad as it was at the start of last year when it was uh, problematic. Obviously, it led to Mac Jones just evaporating. He started seeing ghosts, and we knew that was the end of Mac Jones' career uh, with the Patriots. And it looks like an offensive line that will do just that. So whoever is lining up under center. So obviously, not great from that offensive line. Uh, but the biggest takeaway I had uh, in the Drake May versus Jacoby Brissett conversation is how clear it is to me that Drake May is already better than Jacoby Brissett. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, I, I, obviously I have not been watching any practices. So maybe there are things we're seeing in practice where Jacoby Brissett has the command of the offense more. He's better at calling the plays, reading audibles, whatever. That's a lot of the preseason goes into practices and very little we see in preseason games matters that much. But show me a single preseason snap between Brissett and May where Brissett looks better. Like a single one. And there hasn't been any. Drake May had some checkdowns. He had some scrambles. He had a couple of crosser routes. He had a deep throw that connected. A couple of drops. Some rookie mistakes, but that's to be expected. There has not been a single thing where I was like, wow, Brissett, this is a tough competition. And I think in a vacuum, Drake May ran away with the QB competition in, in training camp. Uh, but... Does that mean you want him to be starting week one, Rich? Absolutely not. Because, yeah. I mean, to me, what also happened, if you removed, like, the five offensive line penalties that we saw but that uh, took away really good plays from Drake May, like that big touchdown pass to K.J. Osborne, like, there were a lot of plays that they were like, just kidding. Here's your third straight, like illegal formation for your left tackle. And to the point where the referees were annoyed, they're like, oh, again, <laughs> the left tackle was in the wrong position. Come on, man. Uh, <laughs> you know, even with all that, Drake made stat line, he could have gone for like 180 and two touchdowns. And we would have been like, oh, clearly, clearly he's the choice. But, you know, if we're just box score scouting now, uh, you don't have that same immediate visceral reaction. But to that point of how bad that offensive line is, I don't want Drake May seeing ghosts this early in his career. Obviously, he's still playing with a tamped-down playbook. Uh, obviously, 
uh, he is still developing and learning as a player. I don't want our team's most valuable prospect lining up behind this offensive line. You know, City Sow avoided injury, thankfully. Um, but that's just one more injury where you basically have David Andrews and uh, Michael Nwenu as your only two healthy players that are good uh, on that offensive line. Obviously, you have like Cole Strange, City Sow. You have a bunch of players that are banged up, returning late from injury. Uh, but like, you know, even Vidarian Lowe has been dealing with injuries of his own. And like, if he's your best option at left tackle, I know you defended him on the previous podcast and he's not as bad as everyone says that he is based off of last year's performance. He's still not good. You know, he is a below average starter. And if he's hurt, then you're dealing with like three rookies on the starting line. David Andrew, who's, who's an elder statesman and then Michael and Wainu, who there for whatever reason is playing out of position again. And so I don't want Drake May behind this offensive line until we feel more confident that whatever lineup they have is actually going to be good. Not even injuries, Rich. I mean, I agree with all that, but like sometimes a lineman will like lose a shoe and will have to take a snap and go out to the sideline and put his shoe back on and come back in. That could be a disastrous snap. If like one guy on the offensive line misses one snap, I'm going to watch with like my hands behind my eyes, like some kid watching a horror movie. It's an absolute disaster. But at the same time, it's such a dick move on my part to be like, well, I really don't want Drake May to get hurt. So I'm more than happy to march poor Jacoby Brissett out there to get absolutely slaughtered by this offensive line for a couple of weeks until he kind of gets hobbled off the field in a cart and we have to put May in. Hopefully that at least at least last till October. But objectively, that's kind of my mentality here. I'm basically letting Jacoby Brissett get demolished for four weeks, not only by the offensive line woes, but just a really tough September slate of games. You got the Bengals, you got the Jets, you got the Niners, and you got the Seahawks. That's that's probably one and three, maybe two and two if they could beat the Jets. But that's not a very fun slate of games for September behind this offensive line. Uh, I never want to see anybody get hurt ever, obviously, but I'm in a scenario where it's like, well, somebody's going to get hurt. Uh, I'd rather it be Jacoby Brissett than, than Drake May, and I feel like a jerk for saying it. You're muted, Rich. I'm muted. We never want anyone to be hurt, right? That's like the big thing. And that's where I feel like it's been continuously neglectful of the front office not to get better veterans in there. Like obviously, uh, and I'm saying obviously a lot, because to me, all of this is obvious. They brought in Chuck Sikorafor and like, that's fine. You're, you're bringing in one player there, which is better than no players there. Uh, but there's a lot of, veterans at that tackle position that aren't necessarily going to be in the Patriots three-year plans that would still put them in a better position than they are now. That would give them more flexibility with what offense they want to run with uh, giving them just an availability to say, you know what, Drake, man, you can go behind these veterans, you know, bring in Charles, Lino, bring in Bakhtiari from the Packers. There's a lot of veterans that, might not even be ring chasing at this point. They just want to get their last paycheck and that's okay. You need to invest in Caden Wallace, let them develop, but they're not ready at this point in time. And if we're at this point where we think that Drake may is better than Jacoby Brissett, but our only hesitation is that we don't want him to get hurt. That's where the Patriots should without hesitation, bring in someone who can start on day one at the tackle position. That's a veteran that, might not have serious upside that might be just an average player, but is one that they have a lot of money. So you might as well do it to protect your most important asset. Well, that is as good a transition as any Rich Hill into our second down, which really matters is the roster cut scenario, the final roster scenario. Let you second down devoted to the offense because we talked about the offensive line pretty much the entire podcast so far. But we do a real quick breakdown of our positional groupings along the offensive line. Then we'll talk about what you like, what you don't like, maybe a surprise, and where they might still need some help. All right. So they picked up three quarterbacks, Brissett, Nay, and Joe Milton. Milton made the squad. They only kept three running backs, which surprised me. Ramondre Stevenson, Antonio Gibson, and Jermichael Hasty was the third guy in there. Six wide receivers on the roster. Demario Douglas, Jalen Polk, KJ Osborne, Tyquan Thornton made the roster. Woof. Ron Baker and Kayshawn Boutte, last one in. 
Three tight ends, Hunter Henry, Austin Hooper, and Jaheim Bell. There are five offensive tackles, Chuck Okafor, Bedarian Lowe, Kaden Wallace, and they brought in Devontae Jacobs and Jack Reed Thomas off of waivers recently. Six guys along the interior offensive line, David Andrews, Michael Nwenu, City Sal, Layden Robinson, Nick Leverett, and Michael Jordan. Those are your offensive weapons and skill players and linemen. Rich Hill, uh, I'll start off asking you, which of those is the biggest surprise, either surprise keep or surprise cut for you? Taekwon Thornton, <laughs> which we know we, we talked about this on the last podcast, that we had to mentally prepare ourselves that he's the starting wide receiver. And we have no evidence to prove otherwise that he's not. Uh, even though he's not producing as a receiver, he very clearly has a specific role in this offense where you think of uh, like late stage Chris Hogan, where he was merely there to take the tops off of a defense so that Julian Edelman can have room to run underneath. That's what Thornton's going to do. So Demario Douglas uh, and Jalen Polk and even KJ Osborne can just catch stuff underneath. I feel like he's sticking around until Kendrick Bourne returns. That's my firm belief. Or someone else suffers uh, an injury and he's able to stick around. But he doesn't offer a special teams value. He uh, doesn't produce. He's showing up better as a blocker. But from the Nikhil Harry experience, I don't want to keep a wide receiver simply because they're a willing blocker. That's not enough. And so... Uh, you know, Jalen Rieger also made the initial uh, roster, but the Patriots released him to make room for one of the four players that they claimed off of waivers, uh, including two offensive tackles. Uh, but to me, Thornton making it biggest surprise uh, simply because I don't see him having done anything to really warrant it. Uh, you know, like Boutte produced during the preseason. Baker, Polk, rookies osborne looked good in the preseason games yeah. i thought he could have produced if you know the offensive tackle wasn't lined up illegally osborne would have had a great stat line in the game uh and so you look at all of these other receivers that did make the roster they're either young and they have you know an opportunity to prove themselves or they produced and thornton's the only exception where he's both been around long enough where we know what he is and also he doesn't produce so uh, I'm a little surprised. I'm wondering if he's sticking around his, his trade value or if he's simply just someone to keep the seat warm as that outside wide receiver until Javon Baker develops a little bit more. Yeah, it might just be he's a starter because who else are they going to throw the ball to? It's not like they have these all this options. There's a really tight competition, certainly possible. Uh, I will say maybe perhaps in defense of Tyquan Thornton, I am very guilty of this some years back. There were maybe two or three seasons where I could not for the life of me, see what the hell the coaching staff saw in James White. I just did not get it. He was this kind of small, not overly mobile running back who they coaching was crazy about, but I never saw him do a damn thing in the preseason or the regular season. And then like his third year, he became an indispensable player, arguable Super Bowl MVP, and a, a great Patriot. So maybe Thornton is going to be making that jump and become like the where the hell did this guy come from type of thing. I don't know. At least he's got the speed. And at least my biggest surprise, Joe Milton to Tyquan Thornton. My go route dream is still alive, Rich Hill. <laughs> Tyquan Thornton to Joe Milton, or Mo Joe Milton to Tyquan Thornton. I am very surprised Joe Milton made it. I think he did enough to make the roster objectively. And I think he did too much uh, to put game tape to sneak onto a practice squad. So I think they had to keep him if they wanted to develop him. I just don't know like what any kind of goal for having Joe Milton on the roster is. I mean, if Drake May is your guy, he's 21 years old. He's going to be your guy for the foreseeable future. Joe Milton's a several year project. I don't, I would not want to start him week one in any capacity. So I don't quite know where he fits on the active roster. I imagine he's a healthy scratch most weeks. They obviously have some kind of plan for him. I just cannot tell you for the life of me what it is beyond if they're down four and they have the ball at the 30 yard line with two seconds left they need to hail mary he's a good guy to have him throw it but i just don't know where joel milton fits in the long-term future of this team as a quarterback yeah i mean it's one where i don't think he needs to have a long-term role if that makes any sense whatsoever because i think drake may is more talented i think drake may is more ready uh joe milton has looked up and down when he's been on the field during the preseason. Bailey Zappi had a ceiling. Bailey Zappi is now in the practice squad for the Chiefs. 
<laughs> so it's a situation where you, at this stage of building a team, you go always, every single time, with the players with more upside. The Patriots do not have the ability or need to say, you're a player who is at best middling. Let me keep you around over someone who might be a little bit more, especially at the quarterback position. And it's where you look at a lot of other quarterback uh, draft picks in years past, whenever there's been like multiple young players to make the team. Think of you know Trey Lance and Brock Purdy. Think of RG3 and Kirk Cousins. It doesn't hurt to have two because even if the younger one or the higher drafted one turns out great, that's awesome. You might as well just also have a second player who could also have a lot of potential. The quarterback room is the one where you get as many high quality lottery picks that you can, because even if he doesn't take the field, it's worth trying because you don't have a quarterback at this point until Drake Mia proves himself. And he hasn't at this point. So keep trying. And that's where Joe Milton obviously provides a lot more value and potential than Bailey Zappi did. I definitely would agree. I take Milton over Zappi in a heartbeat, which is ironic because Zappi's kind of probably going to get another ring this year with the Chiefs. That's kind of a another kick in the pants for Patriots fans. Uh, it's more, I was more surprised they kept three quarterbacks. I figured it'd be Jacob Brissett and Drake May. And then maybe if they needed a third one, they'd bring some veteran in off the waiver wire midseason and have him learn the offense or something along those lines. I was just, I'm pleasantly surprised. And I like Joe Milton. He's one of the more enjoyable parts of the preseason. He's really fun to watch. Maybe there's some scenario where they try and convert him to a receiver like they did with Edelman or Malik uh, Cunningham. Uh, you never know. I don't really see that either. He's a great athlete. And great athletes are hard to come by. So I'm hoping there's some kind of fun role for him. Maybe we'll see like a Mike White Wildcat package like you saw in 2008. They'll take the league by storm for one year and then no one will ever see it again. <laughs> Who knows? But he's my biggest surprise make. Uh, my biggest surprise cut, uh, I think, it's kind of a toss-up. I don't know if it's a super surprise, but Kevin Harris kind of surprised me uh, as a cut. Yeah. I really thought he did enough to make the roster. I'm not upset with the running back room right now. If mine gets us a massive, massive upgrade, Kevin Harris would over over Hastings. But I think he was probably the better third running back uh, so far. And it's just such an indictment of that draft class that, that he's gone now, too. It kind of just makes you, makes you a little nauseous. Oh, totally. Because what? That's Cole Strange, Tyquan Thornton. Marcus Jones are the three picks left from that draft. And everyone else after that is like your, your Jack Jones through uh, whoever the, you know, Chad Ryland or whatever. Sam Roberts. That yeah. yeah. That, it was just a bust. Um, and so uh, not great, not great. And I agree also like Harris did well in that. Now there's nothing that he could have done differently. Um, I do still think bigger picture Jennings has looked better than Harris overall, as it relates to who do I think it, fits an NFL roster better and Jennings joined the Patriots on the practice squad. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if there was some sort of, uh, you know, roster organization still taking place where one of them could still end up on the active roster. Three running backs is a very light room. Um, but like, we'll see, we'll see. I, these, the three best running backs are on the roster. I thought that hasty obviously also adds special teams value but he was very reliable as both a runner and a receiver but also as a blocker which is what they need they and uh obviously gibson's going to be that change of pace back for stevenson um but i did think harris did enough to make the roster even as one of the last players so i wonder if he's uh what what is in the future for him uh, but i could also see him being like run behind this offensive line <laughs> nope thank you i'm good yeah, no, that's true. I mean, again, you have to maybe like a Brandon Ayuk situation where you're like, I'd rather not play New England. Thank you very <laughs> much. Cut day was the best thing that ever happened to me. Uh, but I don't know. Speaking of pick of special teams value and maybe a surprise, and I think he did enough, or at least all he could. Uh, I'm a little, I'm not surprised, but I'm a little disappointed uh, David Wallace didn't crack the roster. There's also yep. news coming out that he's not expected to make the practice squad, probably because he'll get picked up somewhere else. But again, every snap he was given, he did something with it. I guess the thought process here was it's pretty crowded receive room as it is. And how much did Wallace provide beyond kick and punt returner? And there's probably not that much there. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm surprised too. I, I think that they're still probably trying to figure out what special teams is now. Like, What is the value of that return role? And do they have enough players with Marcus Jones on the roster? I mean, you you don't need to have multiple specialists on it. Obviously, Jones is still coming back from an injury, um, but he's been practicing 
it, it's his role to lose, right? Like Marcus Jones is the team's return specialist, all pro player. So I can, I understand why they wouldn't keep David Wallace. And maybe that means more than anything that they're confident that Marcus Jones will be ready to go in week one. Um, but I often, yeah, he, I am surprised that he was not retained if we're talking about him versus Tyquan Thornton as it relates to who actually produced during the preseason, who offered special teams value. I don't know. I, I, I am a little bit surprised as well that he didn't make the team. All right, Richard, I have to ask you this, and I'm going to put this on record. Is As of this podcast, it is Wednesday, August 28th of the 2024 season. Um, what is going to need to happen from, from Tyquan Thornton for you to come on our podcast and be like, you know what? I was wrong about this guy. He's really delivering. Because as much as you love you, some Kendrick Bourne, you do not like you, some Tyquan Thornton. So what's going to cause you to flip the script a little bit with him? All right. If, if Thornton comes out, and I'm not I'm not looking for a thousand yard season. I am looking for Chris Hogan. That's all I want. I want someone who can be 500 yards, maybe be a, a, enough of a threat that you can see his role in the offense where he produces enough individually, but also opens up enough for the rest of the offense that it's very clear why he's there. You know, Chris Hogan wasn't just a decoy. He went for that 180 yards against the Steelers kind of a thing. I don't think one game like that would make me reverse my opinion on Tyquan Thornton. But if he goes out there and he gets 40 yards on three catches, 40 yards on three catches, 40 yards on three catches, 100 yards on six catches, 40 yards on three catches, I'd be like, you know what? Cool. That's his role. He can do that. He's not going to be a Tyreek Hill speedster or anything like that. But if he can perform enough that it forces opposing defenses to have to respect him in a way that I don't think they do, despite his speed, I still saw on the tape that teams were like, I mean, he got a little bit of separation, but I wasn't seeing enough separation that I was like, oh, you, you just give him the opportunities. He'll make something out of it. So it's one where I need to see that consistency out of him. At this age, plus one big day, one big day where it's very clear, okay, that's what the potential was and remains because to this point, he's been nothing. And so the floor has to raise, but we also have to see a potential ceiling. Well, the good, that's a pretty low, pretty low floor, which, all right, I'll take it. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I'm not going to sit here and say I have no expectations for him. I just don't know what to expect out of him. But I feel like I can say that about, pretty much every offensive player beyond Ramondre Stevenson and Hunter Henry and maybe Pop Douglas. But Pop Douglas was very much a ghost yep. this preseason, so maybe he's regressing. I, I don't know. I hope not because he was the lone bright spot on the receiving core last year. But one thing I do like, they were obviously very clearly going towards youth in this cut day. This is a very young offense, which is a good thing, hopefully for future seasons, as long as these guys can continue to develop and, and gather a rapport. But uh, yeah, it should be interesting. All right, so let's get to the defense after this. Hey everyone, it's Alex Shane from Patriots First and Goal here to tell you about Prize Picks. Prize Picks is America's number one daily fantasy sports app with over 5 million active members. It's also the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports because unlike other apps, with Prize Picks, it's just you against the numbers. You just gotta pick more or less on two to six player stat projections, then watch the winnings roll in. Plus, with Prize Picks, if you sign up today, you can get $50 instantly when you play just $5. You don't even need to win to receive the $50 bonus. It's guaranteed. I've always been a big stats guy, so for me, it's all about more or less on stat projections on certain players. I love Patrick Mahomes to throw for more than 4 to 300 yards this season, and for Aaron Rodgers to throw for less than 3750. I will always go for Tyreek Hill more than 1,000 receiving yards and Saquon Barkley for less than 1,000 rushing yards. It's easy to do, and it's a ton of fun. Just download the Prize Picks app today and use the code CLNS, and you'll get a first-round deposit match of up to $100. That's code CLNS on Prize Picks for a deposit match up to $100. Prize Picks, run your game. All right, third and goal, Rich Hill. Let's go through the defenders. This is the strength of the team. Not a lot of shockers here, but a couple of surprises. Uh, we'll start on the defensive line. The Patriots kept seven players there. Godshaw, Keon White, Dietrich Wise, Daniel Kale, Jeremiah Farms, Tristan Hill, and then they brought in Eric Johnson 
off of waivers uh, or free agency. Defensive edge, they got Anthony Jennings, Joss Uche, and O'Shane Zimenez, who had a pretty solid preseason. Linebacker, they have five, Jawan Bentley, Chelani Tavai, Raekwon McMillan, Christian Ellis, and they're running Curtis Jacobs uh, off the waiver wire. Six cornerbacks in the cornerback room, Christian Gonzalez and Jonathan Jones, Marcus Jones, with your partner turning as well, you got Marco Wilson, Alex Austin, and Marcellus Dial Jr. Five safeties, Kyle Duggar, Jabril Peppers, Jalen Hawkins, Brendan Schooler, and Del Pettis. And we'll throw the special teams in here as well. Specialist Joey Sly beat out Chad Ryland for the kickup job, which makes me happy as a gangster name guy. Bryce Berenger, MVP last season on the punter. And then Joe Cardona, the old man of the team at 31, is the long snapper. What are your initial thoughts of the defense? And any big surprises there for you, Rich Hill? Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit surprised uh, at this defensive line room. Um, it's one where Tristan Hill kind of surprised that he made the team, but it's also one where there just isn't a lot of other opportunities. Um, a lot of the other positions kind of made sense, uh, but you know they brought in Eric Johnson, as you mentioned, off of waivers. Uh, it's very clearly the weak point of this defense, and it's one that it had been a strength uh, last year, in my opinion, when you had Godshaw and Barmore there, uh, I'm curious to know if we're going to look at this defensive interior by week four and be like, teams can run at this team at will. Uh, because what was a strength last year for this defense, I feel like could be perceived as a weakness at this stage. Um, but honestly, also, the rest of the defense kind of makes sense. There's a few names out there, like thinking of the the Marco Wilsons, uh, kind of Del Pettis, not fully because, you know, he's young, so I see it, but... Uh, Marco Wilson and Marcellus Dial are two players that when I was either watching them during the preseason or you just think of like the numbers game, uh, I don't, I'm, I'm surprised that they both made the roster. Isaiah Bolden also had made the roster and they released him. So they went deep at that cornerback spot. I would not be surprised if either Dial or Wilson uh, were moved at some point during the roster cuts uh, at this stage. Um, because it's clearly the Patriots stocked up on them with the idea that they might want some players off of waivers. And I would be very surprised if Dial didn't wind up on the practice squad at some point this year. Yeah, it's funny. In terms of me, like there's no, again, like I said, no real massive, holy crap, they just cut Lauren Malloy style uh, shockers. But uh, I'm surprised that Marcella Style made it over, over Wade. I figure Sean Wade would kind of be the last guy in in that secondary room and that he didn't make it uh, a little surprising to me. But other than that, there's really not somebody that's like, holy crap. Again, I am happy that Joey Sly made it. He seemed to just honestly just win the kicker competition. They were given relatively equal reps, uh, and Sly seemed to edge, edge out Chad Ryland. We'll see how he does. I don't know if it's going to be a good thing or a bad thing, but it can't be much worse than it was last season for poor Chad Ryland. Overall, though, look, this is, if the Peach is going to win any games – that all this season is going to be on the backs of this defense. They are not as good as they were when they had Matthew Judon, but that's okay. Again, really, really young and a lot of developers to go. I want to talk a bit, Rich, about the, the linebacker room right now. I feel like the linebackers in the Bill Belichick scheme was always the lifeblood of the defense. You had this certain type of player, these rangy two-way guys that good lateral movement, high football IQ. They could line up on the line if they needed to. You're Dante Hightowers, you're Mike Vrabels, you're Rob Ninkovich's. That's always been just the bread and butter of a good Belichick defense. Looking at the linebacker room now with Jawan Bentley, Johnny Tavai, McMillan, are you happy with the linebackers? Are you surprised there's not more linebacker depth? Uh, do you think there's any confidence there in the linebackers? How do you feel overall about these guys? Yeah, honestly, I feel pretty good. Uh, it's one where you look at the outside linebackers. So looking at the edge players, uh, they let go of Matt Judon for a reason. I'm grouping these all together. So the, the on-ball players, you're thinking of your Keon White, Dietrich Wise, uh, Uche, Anthony Jennings, and Zimenez. Like, that's a strong depth chart right there. You have a couple players who can play inside, outside, and wise and white. You have a couple players that can drop back off ball, uh, thinking of Jennings, Zimenez. So you have good versatility in that unit. You have players that are young. You have players that are promising. You have players that have upside. That's great. I, I think they did a very great job getting the best possible players for where they are on the edge. At the off-ball linebacker spot, Obviously, I was rooting for Steel Chambers purely because that's an A plus name. Uh, you know, wish that his play kind of backed up that name. Uh, but also, again, I think they got the best players there. Bentley and Tavai are your starters. 
And when you think of their depth players, obviously Taki Taki's been dealing with the injury. He's number three if, if and when he's available and healthy. So he's on the pup list. Um, but behind him, they like Raekwon McMillan. He has starter experience on defense, but also as a core special teams player, went around. They like his leadership. He's someone that I think that uh, could have a bigger role uh, should the cards fall his way. And then Christian Ellis earned it. Earned it a lot. Will be a special teams player. Uh, has bounced around the league a little bit. Doesn't have a lot of starters experience. But when his number was called during the preseason, he rose to the occasion. So uh, I liked what they did. I think uh, when you look at Ellis, he's like the one player that is not as well known as the other ones, either from uh, you know proven on the Patriots or proven elsewhere. Uh, I'm thinking of McMillan. Uh, but it's one where, I don't know, I get it. He's got the speed. He's got more of that side to be a special teams player with a uh, defensive upside. Think of like the Tracy Whites of the world uh, doing a throwback to 2011 on that, where uh, I think the team needs to have more of those linebacker spots with this new special teams kickoff and kick return lineup. Uh, I think that's one of the strategies that they're going to try and figure out is do we need more speed guys or based off of what the goal might be on returns? Are you just trying to get an extra 10 yards and is that where getting a bigger but less fast person versus you know line uh cornerbacks and wide receivers is that a better option and so i think they did a great job of the linebacker role good mix of youth good mix of upside uh with proven ability and uh, i think if you compare them now versus what they were last year i'm happy with where they stand if you want to make a memory you got to go to game time all right game time has a new feature called game time picks that makes getting tickets to see your favorite teams play live even easier. Game Time Picks filters out the fluff to show you all the incredible deals and the great seats so you don't have to waste time searching through thousands of seats. You've got the super deal. Don't forget about the super deal. And curated deals, they make it easier to find the best price on great seats. And I think this is so cool is when you, you click on the ticket, right, you go, you go to the app. If you want to go to a game in Boston, you want to go to a game in New York or Philadelphia, whatever, you go to the city. And you click on the game you want to go to, and then they just show you a great, uh, easy-to-read layout of the stadium. And then you cl click on the seat you want, and then you get a view of the seat right from there. Boom. You, you, you know what you're buying. So you get seat views before you buy, and they have the lowest price guarantee, event cancellation, protection, job loss. It, it's terrific. So toggling, toggling here with the Game Time app. Now, this feature shows the total upfront. No surprise fees at checkout, so you know what you're dealing with. You don't click on the button after and you go, wait a minute, what's that extra 20 bucks for? Uh, also, Game Time will credit you 110% of the difference for the lowest price guarantee. They have the lowest price guarantee, or Game Time will credit you up to 100% of the difference. And your purchase is covered with the most flexible customer service policy in the ticketing industry. So, take the guesswork of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, use the code CLNS for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem the code CLNS for $20 off. Download Game Time today. What time is it? Game Time. Do you see any role, Rich, for one of the uh, the Pup guys? Another great name, Sion Taki Taki, coming back off. He's with mm -hmm. Coltrane and Kendrick Bourne, along with Christian Barmore on the non-FI reserve list. So hopefully all those guys came back at some point this season. Uh, you see Taki Taki playing a role as like a core linebacker. Or is he more a special teamer? I feel like he's a core special teamer. I think if you were healthy for the whole offseason, uh, I, I think that he might be that third linebacker. You know, if you're trying to go in a heavy set, you need to have three off ball guys. He could have been that person. I don't know where he stands based off of what practice has looked like. I think McMillan has kind of taken on that role or, you know, they, they're kind of competing for the same sort of function on this team. And then obviously like Mapu as well. I know he's lined up as a safety, but uh, I feel like those are your players that are, you're a little bit lighter than your traditional Patriots, 250 pound interior linebackers, uh, you know, thinking more of that 230 to 240 kind of size, uh, but it has the speed to be able to play on special teams. Um, I see it. I see there being a role, but I also see them not needing him to return. And that's better. That's like, that's a fine spot that makes you feel like the depth chart is strong because I would like for Taki Taki to contribute. He's a good player. Yeah. But for me to look at the final roster here and be like, regardless of whether or not he comes back, it's going to be a strong unit. Love it. Great team building. Way better than what you see on the other side of the ball.
No, it's true. Again, I think the, again, it's, it's a deep defense. Uh, there's not a position where, like, the offensive line is like, I hope nobody loses a shoe for a single down because someone will definitely be able to step in at some point. Uh, last thing I'll ask, Richard, as we get the third down, since we lumped in the special teamers here, you happy with Joey Sly? And who do you want uh, besides Marcus Jones returning kicks? Yeah, uh, I'm happy with Joey Sly. It's one where uh, I feel like kicking is one of the hardest jobs in the NFL. It's one that is both thankless. You're expected to do your one job. And it's where, you know, one bad season can derail your time with the team. I think that Sly has been around the league enough where he's proven himself. I think you see a lot of stories of kickers who have put together good tenures with the team, have one bad year, get released, and then go on to have another 10-year career with a different franchise and have it work out for them. I, I completely envision Sly being that type of a kicker where I don't think he's going to be a uh, Justin Tucker, obviously. Um, but can he be Nick Folk with a little bit of a stronger leg without question? I, I think maybe Folk might be a little bit more accurate within 40, but Sly has, gives you more of an opportunity beyond 40. So changing strengths and weaknesses on that one. Um, but it's one where I feel like at the end of the day, the kicker position won't be the reason why they lost three games like it was last year. It's easy to forget that Joey Sly has been in the league since like 2019, I think. You don't think he's been around as long as he has, but he's been around and he actually won the position uh, in 2019 with the Panthers, if I remember correctly. Texans, yep. Niners, and uh, Commanders and Jaguars before they came to Patriots. So hopefully he's found a, a home here. I don't know what's going to happen with him, but again, love the name, so I'm happy with it. Um, all right, Michelle, fourth down. We've got the roster. We've got our 53. The practice squad's being filled out slowly. There are plenty of players who've been cut around the league all over positionally that could be a good fit for the Patriots. I know one guy that's already being tied to the Patriots is offensive line Jaron Christian. Uh, I think it was the Browns last year. Maybe offensive line's where they go. But are there any running backs, wide receivers, tight ends, whoever, anywhere in the NFL who no longer have a team you'd love to see go to the Patriots? Yeah, I mean, it's one where... Uh, I think we're still waiting for the dust to settle, if that makes sense. I think team, we, the Patriots aren't a destination anymore in the sense that uh, teams will be like, oh, yeah, yeah I'm going to I have the chance to join the Patriots. So therefore, like, I'm going to go do it. I think what the Patriots are going to have to do is a lot of bargain bin shopping. They're going to have to go find a lot, a lot of players that don't get picked on these other teams. And uh, I don't think that there's anyone that like to me fully stands out of like, they need to get them in part because uh, they're not in a win now mode. There's not like a single veteran that will come on to the Patriots at this stage and turn them into a contender. But, uh, you know, this year, last year, that ultimately didn't make the roster. Thinking of um, oh, blanking on his name, but you know, whenever there's those like five star prospects that, for whatever reason, fell in the draft due to injury, that uh, you know they they didn't contribute in their first couple of years, maybe they got released due to injury. The O'Shane Zimenez type of players, get them, go get them, get the the high upside players. Or on the other side of it, thinking what we're talking about at the beginning of this podcast, thinking of Drake May. What gets you the best opportunity to develop the most important position on your team? It's not walking out Caden Wallace as your offensive tackle at this point. It's, it's not getting the Darian Lowe as your best hope at tackle. It's one where you, they have money. Go get one of those veteran tackles that you know you can plug and play. They'll be in that you know 20 to 25 range of caliber as a starter. But you got to shore that line up. You absolutely have to. Um, and if I were them, you know, obviously they claimed two offensive tackles off of waivers. Neither of them really has game experience. And to me, it feels very similar to last year when it's like, okay, you got like Calvin Anderson, Vidarian Lowe, Tyrone Wheatley, Riley Rife. You got like all of these players where you're just like, I mean, I guess uh, <laughs> you're, 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 those are low grade lottery tickets because they were never good. They, they were all players that had the chance to be good, but what they need to do is get some players with proven ability at that tackle spot and like get a Jacoby Brissett of offensive tackles. That's what their goal should be. Get someone who then your younger players have to outperform 
to get that starting job, not do what we talked on our last podcast where people are just kind of given the role because there's no one else. Yeah, I mean, look, at the end of the day, if you didn't make the NFL roster, odds are pretty good you weren't good enough to make that NFL roster. There are certain situations where you're just not a good fit and you'll get snatched up right away and you work really well in the system. And the Patriots have luck in the past. They find guys in the scrap heap that come on this Thursday. They crush it in the Bill Belichick system. Uh, but with the line being what it is, you just have to wonder, is there an upgrade out there to be had for the money that they have? I, I just I, I just don't see it. Maybe they're best off just going really, really hard with the guys they have and, and hoping for the best. I'm going to throw two names out there, Rich Hill. Uh, I can see you on screen, so I'm looking forward to looking at your facial reaction to this one. Uh, there are two receivers. Donovan Peoples-Jones is a free agent right now. All right. Yes. And uh, Kadarius Toney is a free no. agent right now. Okay. All right. They it went exactly as I expected. Uh, Kadarius <laughs> Toney, I, I think Tony. look, Tony's a good player. He gets the drop stigma, and rightly so. Uh, don't want him. But I think Peoples-Jones could be a good fit in the system. He's got experience with the Alex Van Pelt system. Uh, I think he had yep. two, almost 900 receiving yards in like 2022, was it, yeah. with Alex Van Pelt? Um, he had a, had a lousy 2023, and he didn't quite make the cut with the Lions, but he's got boundary experience. He's a big guy. Yep. He may be able to edge out Tyquan Thornton for you, yep. do you a favor. So why not, right? Totally. I mean, that that's exactly it. That That is the move. Uh, you know, talking about get the Jacoby Brissett of a certain role. That's what Jonathan Peoples-Jones is. Like, obviously, he was lackluster with the Lions. Obviously, came out, did not produce, was let go. He also did not perform in the Browns offense well at all this past year, which was a little bit surprising. But you look at how he trended 2020 to 2021 to 2022, and you saw that gradual year. 304 yards, 597, 839. He's someone that you look at and go, yeah, he was continuously improving. Think of like the Jacoby Myers-esque type of a player. Obviously, six-round pick, uh, not someone that you're like, oh, he's you know a top-tier talent at that role. But it's one where uh, y- you do need to improve on the margins. You do need to. He had those years of experience with them, three years, you know, four years of experience with them. Uh, obviously, he did not perform as desired as wide receiver this past year. Um, but obviously also they had a different wide receiver room and uh, they were dealing with all of their injuries, a lot of turnover and everything like that. And they traded him because he wasn't happy with his role. And so um, I feel like, yeah, you know, he's from Detroit originally. He went back home to Detroit. Didn't work out for him. Uh, I think that that's exactly the type of player that we described as someone who has performed in the past or for whatever reason has a lower stock value than what we've seen. And, you know, getting a 61 reception, 839 yard receiver uh, would immediately, immediately make him the most productive receiver on this team. <laughs> and so sure. if, if you can do that, you go for it. Cause like, I'm not expecting him to be a burner. I'm not expecting him to, to do anything like that. Although he has speed, you know, he's six foot two, 4.48. He's got that ability, got the explosion. Um, go for it. That, that makes sense to me. No, it does. Uh, who do they cut? I don't know. But they're part of there are people out there. I know who you're going to say, Rich Hill. Just shut up. <laughs> I leaned in for those listening <laughs> over the podcast. As soon as I said, who are you going to cut? I leaned hard towards you the did. microphone. Breathing hard. Now you, you started to nail and I cut you right off Dr. Evil style. <laughs> One of those. But the thing is, there's going to be other players <laughs> that are going to be cut throughout the course of the next couple of weeks. We're starting to turn towards that first game of the season. Uh, I, at this point, would rather just kind of roll with the guys they have for now and just hope for the best. But that's uh, that's our roster, Rich Hill. That's our four downs. We're going to have ourselves a season. Uh, So let's do a kick an extra point now that we're kind of into the regular season. Uh, They kind of go hand in hand a little bit. Uh, Gerard Mayo has said today that they've made the decision on the starting quarterback. They haven't announced it to the team yet. They're going to discuss internally and then make the announcement. So two-part question. If you had to guess, who does he announce as the starter? And two, second, how do you feel Gerard Mayo is doing so far as a head coach in terms of the way he interacts with the media, how and transparent he is, how he was as a player versus how he's as a coach? Are you are you like what he's bringing to the table? Do you think he's still finding his footing? What are your overall kind of Gerard Mayo coaching media relations impressions? Yeah, I mean, wait, is that Mac Jones's music? That's usually <laughs> the starter. Um, I I feel like they're gonna go with Jacoby Brissett. I think that tying this into how is Mayo's conversation been. He went to the media and specifically said, Drake May has been outplaying Jacoby Brissett, which to me 
is a big it's a big statement to make because then are you saying you're not going with who's been the better player if you go with Jacoby Brissett? That's what he's walking into. I think maybe they could have gotten their evaluation back. Jacoby Brissett suffered a shoulder injury during that game against the Commanders. Maybe the decision was made for them. Maybe it's pretty easy and you just go, hey, we got bad diagnosis. He won't be ready for four weeks. Drake May, you got it. And if you do well over the first four weeks, still your job. Um, but we don't know that at this point in time. I think that if he's healthy, it's going to be Jacoby. If it's not, if he's slightly dinged up, easy reason to go to Drake May and let him figure it out. I think what Mayo is going to have to learn as, at this job is that he is the CEO of the team and that transparency and understanding the players is extremely important and it's something that he's really, really good at. But what he also has to do is understand what his words impart to all of the external audiences because he, people are hanging on to his words in a way that they've never done before. And I feel like there's been multiple times this off season, whenever when he's like, we're going to spend all this money uh, during March or whatever. And he had to walk that back right quick. Um, I feel like he's had multiple of those things where he's had to walk back something that he said, because, you know, he's kind of freewheeling a little bit, you know, he's having just a, a regular conversation, but he doesn't fully comprehend that everything that he says will be dissected. And so I don't mind him being upfront and being like, yeah, Drake May has been outperforming Jacoby Brissett, but then that has to be accompanied by, and that's why he's our starter. You don't say that until you've made that decision as to who will be the starter and he's going to get better with it. But it's one where, you know, I don't care if he says these things, he just has to know what the ramifications of those public statements are. Yeah, I mean, like, it does make me have a renewed appreciation for the Bill Belichick press conference. Of, yeah. We're just going to play the best players, I think, or the best players for the best day of the best game. Something, you know, that's this really non sequitur that makes no sense. Uh, it makes you kind of appreciate that a little bit more. And in a Boston media that's been starved of any sound bites for 20 years, uh, to have a guy like Mayo, I yep. think they're, they're also going overboard a little bit in their overanalyzation of what Mayo has to say. It's an interesting feeling out period. And you said it best. As long as inside the locker room, nothing he says is causing any problems, do you find your stride as a head coach? You don't want to be a Bill Belichick clone. You don't want to be a uh, Denny Green. We are who they thought they were kind of yuck job. Uh, you got to find your, your ground a little bit. And he is still finding it. I personally wish he was a little less transparent with his kind of mannerisms, but uh, maybe he'll dial it back a bit once we get into the season that actually matters. Uh, I also think it will be Jacoby Brissett, but again, it's going to be tough for them to be like, May's outplayed Jacoby Brissett, but we're starting him, and they're going to be like, why? And May's going to have to say something, well, you know, just some developments have happened, and he can't be like, their offensive line sucks, and Brissett's going to get hurt. You can't say that. Um, so, <laughs> accountability for yourself and knowing that your words are recorded and written down and they have receipts and they can point to, here's what you said. I have the recording of you saying Drake may is playing better and you're starting to come set now. Why he has to answer yep. that. So those are kind of the growing pains that'll come with the season. Yep. And all it will take is one bad performance from Jacoby Brissett for everyone to be like, look at the receipt. It should be Drake may. If Brissett comes out there and he looks bad opening week, you can guarantee that people would say put in Drake may and for good reason. Um, but we'll be able to break all that down later on uh, in this off season. As we head into week one Whew. for the Patriots, finally time for the regular season. Alec, do you have any final thoughts as we head into the 2024 year? Let me just remark that uh, I won the preseason predictions two to one. So I get to predict next week. So suck Great. it. And as we all know, whoever wins the preseason translates exactly and perfectly into the regular season. Uh, the <laughs> all right. Well, I'm excited to just go 0 for 17 this year. <laughs> Alec, do you have any final thoughts? That'll do it, buddy. All right. Until next time, you have a good one. Later, man.